everyone. We are um, the midterm, the second midterm grade should be posted. I hope that we should be able to pass it back to you probably Thursday. This th um, the solutions aren't up yet because there's still some outstanding exams. Um, you have a homework due next Tuesday, and there is a lab this Friday. I'll post that sometime after class today. Um, and there are really two main topics left in the course, which is going to be regression and ANOVA. Uh, any questions before? Yeah. Uh, it should be, I think it's a 50. It should be posted as well. I think it's a 50, although I will say that the variance on this exam was a lot more than the variance on the last exam. Okay? Uh, do you want me to put up a distribution plot of the scores on this exam? It's 50 out of 60, right? Yeah. Can we solve for population parameters? Yes. <laughs> I get extra credit for doing so. So, um, but any other questions? Exactly the population parameters, since the population is just our class. Okay. I'm assuming the whole world takes it. Mm -hmm. All right, so what we're going to do is. Then we have a function as well as the sample size. Be doing regression. Regression. And, and on Thursday, okay? Uh, we've seen, I think we've design, seen right? regression before. You guys remember seeing regression before in this class? Yeah, no. In coding. No. You actually did. When we did maximum likelihood <coughs> estimation. Okay, remember when we were fitting lines? Yeah? No? Yes. It was a long time ago, I know. Uh, so, <laughs> we're going to go over regression. We're going to look at it in two different ways. Um, and First way is going to be uh, less looking at it from a distributional perspective, and the second way is going to be looking at it much more from a distributional perspective. So first, we're going to look at the idea of uh, correlation, and um, so everyone, most of us, are you guys okay with this big equation of a line? Yeah, it's got a slope, which is beta one. Intercept, beta zero. Um, sometimes we call this y equals mx plus b, but that's what's going on. And you guys, anyone, I guess we can guess who this is? This is Descartes. This is Descartes. Um, he was, I guess, the first person who came up with algebraic geometry. Anyone want to take a guess why algebraic geometry is called algebraic geometry? It's got two words, algebraic and geometry. Anyone want to take a guess? The idea behind algebraic geometry is you can turn geometry into problems in algebra. An example is y equals mx plus b, right? This right here is a geometric object. We call it a line, right? And Shockingly enough, this is written in an algebraic form. Okay? And so basically, it's just the idea you can do things with coordinates. This has been a very popular problem for a long time amongst people. So, um, anyone want to guess what this is? Projectile launching. Projectile launching, okay? So this was really important, well, for a long time, because people cared about cannonballs. Going into World War I and World War II, actually, this was important as well, um, more in terms of missiles and things like that. I'm not quite sure why this thing has shifted. Let me see if I can unshift this. Do you think it's a projector that shifted? Yeah, it's a projector that shifted. Um, well, we'll just... No, Hold up. Well, you can see on the right side it's getting chopped off, so if you start to get off. Yeah, well, let, me, let me just try one thing, and then I'll see if I can. Computer screen, it was nearly identical to 
the projector. Yeah, yeah, it was cut off on the right. No, on that computer screen. What about like it? You can see it on the computer screen, and it was nearly identical to the projector. Meaning, and look, they're blue, this blue screen, it's not off the screen, so the projector right. is not cut off. Right. Oh, is that, oh, you're, I thought you were saying it is well, cut off. It, the no, the projector is fine. Oh, the know, whatever, it's the whatever, display. Whatever. No, yeah. I don't think it really matters. Okay. No, but it does. What? It does. Okay. Uh, I think you need to increase the resolution. Yeah, Yeah, just do the maximum. Trajectories have fallen a little bit, but we'll see what happens in terms of the future. You could also just uh, make that full screen and then yeah, zoom in a bit. Yeah. I would just go with this. Okay. So, one of the first people to look at uh, correlation, and I think we mentioned this before, was uh, Francis Galton. Um, he was also the first person to look at two variables at a time, because if you think about correlation, you kind of need to think about two variables at a time. Uh, he, was a, he was a busy guy, um, and one of the first things he thought about in terms of thinking about uh, correlation was height, and we'll get to that in a second. But uh, basically, correlation is just a, it's a linear association between two variables. Okay. So this was an early example. It was a relationship between heights of fathers and heights of sons. Um, taller fathers have taller sons. Shorter fathers tend to have shorter sons. And the idea was if they're perfectly predictive, it would just be a straight line. So that's what they thought about. And so this is the idea of correlation. It's just how two variables are correlated, right? Do you guys remember we looked at correlation coefficients before? Yeah, do you remember what the formula for correlation was? If I have two random variables, x and y, what's a correlation between x and y? You guys remember what this was going to be equal to? There are two things. What's in the numerator? Covariance. Yep, the covariance of x comma y. And what's in the denominator? Right, the standard deviation of x times y standard deviation of y. Okay? So that's that's just correlation. Another way of thinking about correlation is you can basically draw the heights, let's say, of the fathers on the x-axis and the sons on the y-axis, and then try to fit a line to it. And the slope of the line is going to be the correlation. And so an important idea was this. And this is what the actual name came from. It's called regression to the mean. So if you have a very tall father, the sons are going to be a little bit shorter, typically shorter. 
and someone who's exceptionally short is going to have taller children. So let's actually take a look at this, okay? So there are two different ways we can think about this. This is the height of the father, these are the heights of the sons. And if we think about the correlation coefficient, right, we can just look at the covariance of x and y, right? And we could divide it by the variance. So that's one way of looking at it. What's the other way of thinking about this? If we want to think about it as a regression, what would we do? We have all of these dots, then what do we do with these dots? We fit something to it. What do we fit? We fit a line to it, okay? Now the idea about regression is the following. Let's look at a very tall uh, father. <coughs> okay? So let's say we pick, I don't know, we will pick someone out here. Okay? Now, on average, is the son going to be taller or shorter than the father? Shorter, okay. If the son were taller than the father, where would the son fall on this line? Above, right? But typically, the further out I go, the more right sons that I have down here. On the reciprocal end, if I look for a short son, what's going to probably happen with the father? It's going to be taller, which means it's going to be in which direction? It's going to be what? So if we look at a short father, let's take a little different. If we look at a short father, what's going to be probably true of this son? Taller. Taller, right? So again, above the line, right? So on this side, it's going to be below the line. This side, it's going to be above the line. What's going to happen around the middle? On the line. On the line. They should more or less coincide, okay? So again, this was the idea of regression to the mean, okay? So wouldn't the slope actually be a little more horizontal then? Wouldn't the slope be more? What? If we're modeling the data using a line, uh -huh. wouldn't the slope just be a little more horizontal then? More horizontal than what? Than the current line. Like, if that more close, more close you, you to the slope. You think that the slope should be more like this? Right. Uh, or is that just like the line that we get from fitting? That's just the line that we got. I can. I mean, I can take it up with the code, but, no, but this, okay. <laughs> this is the line that we got. It, okay. Uh, but, okay, so that's, that, that's just a classic example. So, okay, so I think we talked about this before. The sample correlation coefficient R, it's just measuring the strength of association between X and Y. And the values, the values that we were looking at there, those dots, that's just a scatter plot. <coughs> it's, it's one, then knowing one variable determines the other one perfectly. If the relationship is linear, these are properties between R, between minus one and one. Again, if the two variables are absolutely positively <coughs> correlated, it's going to be one. It's going to be negative one if there's a slope. And it could be zero. This is an important point. A lot of times when you say R or the correlation is no, not zero, you might want to say that these are not related at all. That's not essentially technically true. Um, what it's saying is given a linear model, you do not have any evidence for them being associated or causal, okay? but. They're, it's a little bit more tricky, they're more compound. And this goes back to this whole thing about correlation does not necessarily imply causation, okay? Um, the square of the correlation is called the coefficient of determination, and it's a proportion of variation in y that is explained by x. This is a really important idea, this coefficient of determination, okay? So if the two variables are absolutely correlated, what would be the coefficient of determination? One. one, right? R can be, if R is negative, let's say R is one. What's the coefficient of determination? It's one, right? What happens if R is negative one? What's the coefficient of determination? It is one, one right? Because negative one squared is one. So the point is the coefficient of determination is really telling us how much of the variance in Y is explained by X, right? If I could tell you 
So now can, if I can explain all the variation in y by x, then that's identical to saying that x is completely determining y. Right? That these two things are deterministic. Okay? So let's write one thing down. So let's say I have the following formula, which we saw before. Y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus <coughs> epsilon. Okay? You've seen this before. Okay? So for a second, let's say epsilon <coughs> is drawn from a normal distribution with mean 0. And let's say it's got standard deviation 0. Okay? What does it mean to have standard deviation zero? It means what? There's no variance. What? So what does that mean by about epsilon? What is it? Always. It's always zero. Okay? So what could I do here? What could I do with this epsilon? Just erase it. Okay? This is my model. Okay? So. Question number one. What is R here? What's R? Is it just going to be beta 1? <coughs> what was R again? You guys remember what R was? I think I wrote it a little bit ago, right? R was what? The covariance divided by the standard deviation, right? Okay, so is it going to be beta 1? <coughs> no? Yes? No, right? Because there's no, it's, it's normalized. So what's R in this case? It, it can take one of two values. One or negative one. Exactly. So R is going to equal 1 or negative 1. When is R going to be 1? Yeah, when is R going to be negative 1? Beta 1 is negative. <coughs> so actually, I lied. You can also be 0 if beta 1 were 0. OK? Although we have all kinds of problems with beta 1, 0. So, but, but. so, okay, so let's just say beta 1 is not equal to 0, so r is 1 or minus 1, okay? So what's the coefficient of determination here? The coefficient of determination is sometimes called r squared. So what's r squared equal to here? It's 1, right? What does that say? That, that says all of the variance in y is explained by what? x, right? It also says in this case this thing's purely deterministic. If I tell you what x is, you can tell me exactly what y is. So all of the variance in y is being explained. Okay? So let's go back to the case of height in uh, the fathers and the sons. Okay? So in the case of the fathers and the sons, what do you think the coefficient of determination is? Just roughly eyeball. You think it's one? How many people think it's one? Okay, we got no one who thinks it's one. How many people think it's zero? Okay, what do you want to call it? Anyone want to take a guess? Maybe 0.7? Well, we can work it out later. But so, yeah, but it's, it's just explaining how much variation I still have. Okay, so oh, actually one question. So, you know, people are still studying height. So this may sound crazy, but this is a thing that's still looked at. And the question is, how many people here believe that height is somewhat genetic and that one's height is going to be related to the height of their parents? Okay, good. We have a bunch of people who think it's kind of genetic. How many people don't think it's genetic, think it's not genetic? Okay, we have no one who thinks it's not genetic. Um, so one of the things people have done is they've gone through 
and they have looked at the genomes of people. And what they've asked is, if I look at your gene sequence, gene sequence, can I explain height? How much of my, how much does genetic variation within sequence explain height? Okay. Everyone here said height is genetic, right? Anyone? No one disagreed with height being genetic, right? So, how much of your genome, how much of your of the genetic variation in your genome, so far using standard methods people have, do you think explain height? You think of it this way. We're going to do multivariate regression in a little bit, right? So think about y is your height, and x is each position that varies in your genome, how it's coded, right? Is it an AC, an AG, right? We can code this, for example, 0, 1, 2. So the question is, how much does genetic variation in your genome explain height? What would you expect it to be? Yeah? Well, like, what do you mean? Sorry. Uh, what do I mean? I mean, sorry, never mind. Are you no, no. <laughs> how much of your genetic code is uh, determining height, or how much of your height is determined by genetic code? So that's a good question. So what I'm asking you is if I think about height as a trait, right, I'm asking you how much does variation in your genetic code correlate to that? I'll give you a different example. Eye color. Okay, let's do blue, blue eye color versus green. Actually, blue versus brown, okay? And my question is, how much does your genetic code explain your eye color? If I told you your genetic code, could you tell me your eye color perfectly accurately? Yes. Yes, okay? For blue versus brown, this is certainly true. 100% using just one position in your genetic code. We can do that, okay? So in that case, what's R squared? One, right? It's purely deterministic. Okay? So now my question is, okay, let's 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 get a little bit more complicated. Instead of blue versus brown, <coughs> let me ask you about green versus blue. And shades of green. Okay? Now I ask you, I give you a bunch of positions in your genetic code. How accurately, how well can you predict <coughs> eye color? What variation We'll come back to that. So, but that's that's a question that I. It's around sixty or seven. It's around seventy percent. It turns out, it's it's harder to do, shades of green and hazel and blue. Now, going back to height, right? We did the eye color example. What about height? How much height can we explain? Maybe not all of it. I mean, maybe there's environmental factors. So you're okay. So the statement is maybe not all of it. Maybe there are environmental factors, right? It turns out that right now, using a lot of the standard methods we use, it's really sad. It's like 10%, which is probably an indictment of the methods that we're using and what we're looking for and our lack of understanding of what this variation means and does. But the point I was telling you, people are still looking at height and trying to understand it. Okay? <laughs> so, so, okay. So now, how do we get this coefficient of determination? So there are a set of equations, okay? What's this? This is a standard deviation in, in what? For what variable? X. It's actually not quite the standard deviation of x. Why is it not quite the standard deviation of x? I didn't divide by 1 over n, okay? So you can just think of this as S, S is just uh, really, it's a sum squared variation in X, right? So this is a mean of X, and we're just looking at this, the amount of sum squared error. This is the same thing with Y, and then what is this? What does this look like? What does this look a little bit like? Have we seen anything like this? It looks a little bit like covariance, right? How would I how would I get covariance from this? You'd replace the sum with a why don't we just write it down? You guys remember the formula for the covariance? What was the covariance of x and y? It 
was gonna. It was the integral of what? It's a double integral of what? X minus mu sub x, y minus mu sub y, times what? Right, just times the joint density, right? So this is something similar. You're just looking at on your observed data, right? These are each of my x's. I'm subtracting off by the sample mean. Similarly, my y's, each of my y's I'm sampling, subtracting off by the sample mean. I'm just adding them up, okay? And so our sample correlation <coughs> is simply S of xy times divided by the square root of SXX, SYY. Okay? And this is related to, I think, what we call rho of xy, which was the covariance of x and y by the square root of the variance of x times the variance of y. One way you can think about this is when we think about the variance in x, right, that's a property of the population, right? You have to integrate over the entire distribution, okay? This is like asking, what's the variance in my sample in x? This is a question about what's the variance in my sample of y? And this is what's a covariance sample covariance of x and y. And then this r is really similar to that row. It's just being computed in the same. OK? OK, so this is something that is sometimes looked at. So if you look at the rates of unemployment and spousal abuse in six cities, and you want to say, OK, well, how correlated are they? Is there some correlation between these two? And so what you can do is you compute the sample variance in unemployment and the spousal abuse and then the covariance between the two, and then you get a strong correlation. Okay? There, there's something that often is done in these studies, which is once you find a correlation, what, what is very tempting to say? Correlation and causation. Yeah, that, uh, that, well, you know, unemployment might be causing <coughs> spousal abuse, right? And that is a little bit of a trickier thing to say because then you're actually implying that there is a mechanism, right? Or there is an actual way this is happening, which could be true, it may not be true. Right? It could be that there's something that's very strongly correlated with unemployment that's causing spousal abuse, right? And it may not be spousal abuse itself. Okay? A classic example of this is how many people here think smoking is causal with respect to getting lung cancer? Anyone? Okay. Anyone here smoking think smoking is not causal? with respect to getting lung cancer. Okay, so there were, there was a very well-known statistician who argued that this is not true, and that was Fisher. And there, there's other more modern statisticians who've argued this as well, including a person who's one of the top experts in causal inference. Now, there's an argument to be made to say something, how do you say something is causal? Do you guys have any <coughs> idea of how to determine going beyond correlations and saying how something is causal? Just intuitively, how would you do it? Control experiment. You'd want to do a controlled experiment, yeah? Mm, run it many times. Run it many times. So, so there's exactly, what you can do is you can do a controlled experiment and you can run it many times and you can do this by randomizing. You can take individuals, right, and you can randomize them or you can control for them in one way or the other and then see if you get the same type of outcome. In the case of smoking and lung cancer, <coughs> what would you do? You take an individual, right? You copy the individual exactly, 
and then you'd have one copy of the person smoke and the other copy of the person not smoke. And you'd do this many, many times, right? What is the problem with what I just suggested? You can't copy the person, okay? Yeah, you could draw, so yeah, so twins. Twin studies are very natural randomization studies. So a lot of times in these types of studies, people look for twins. They look for large groups of twins, and they run these things, and they check them. Uh, one thing you could do is you could also do this, sometimes they do this in mouse models. They go and they take mice, they randomize them, they give half of them smoke, they have half of them smoke, the other half don't smoke, and then they see what happens. What's interesting in all of these mice trials, right, they still found no association between, strict association between smoking and lung cancer. Does anyone want to take a guess why? The mouse, die, the mice die of something else first. Because the problem with mice is they don't actually smoke like people. It's really hard to get them to, right? So you actually stick them in a little cage and you start pumping tobacco into them, right? So they get like emphysema, they get skin cancer. I mean, bad things happen to them, but they don't die of lung cancer, right? And so it's actually pretty brutal. But anyway, so so that's just a slight aside there, okay? So. The question is, we computed R, right? And in the previous case, we saw R is pretty big, right? What did we say? It was 0.92, right? So what, what's a natural question to ask about this? It's 0.92. Is that, does that mean that there is a strong correlation or not? It looks it, right? How do I think about it in a more formal way? Anyone want to take a guess? Yeah, we can do the hypothesis test. What's our null hypothesis? Right? What's going to be our null hypothesis in this case? R is zero, right? That these two are not related, okay? And then our alternative is R is not equal to zero. Now, why can we think of this as a T statistic? Anyone? Do you guys remember what R looks like? It's a proportion. It's a proportion, exactly. So what does R look like? R looks like we have in the numerator sum over what? Xi minus Xi x bar, right, times what? Yi I minus Yi bar. And what's in the denominator? Square root of the sum over <coughs> xi minus x bar quantity squared times yi minus y bar quantity squared, okay? Okay, now what's random here? Is x random in our model? You guys remember? Not necessarily, right? X could just be fixed. Is Y random? <coughs> yeah, no. Y is random, let's say. Or they could both possibly be random. Either way, the numerator is random, right? And the denominator is also random, OK? Because even if X isn't random, Y is random, right? And that's why we get the T statistic. Again? Do you mind explaining that? So. Sure. So let's pretend for a second x is not random. Okay? x is not random. Okay? So you can just pretend these x's are constant. Okay? Just some known constant. What are y's? Y's are random, right? So if I if this is over i equals 1 through n, let's say n's bigger than 30, okay? If n's bigger than 30, what's this going to look like? What's the numerator going to look like? There's something, we call it the central limit theorem, and it tells us our numerator is going to look like what? Normal, right? A numerator is going to look like normal. Okay, good. How about a denominator? Pretend again that these are constants, okay? These aren't random. But why, why is random, right? Okay, 
So again, pretend I is reasonable and is reasonably big. What's the denominator going to look like? Is it going to be normal? It's not good. Why? Why is it not normal? Because I squared them. So what's it going to look like? What happens when we start to chi squared? Right. So this is going to be chi squared. Okay. So if you remember, what happens if I take a normal and divide it by a chi squared? I get a a t. Okay. That's why this is a t. And um, so, okay, so R was 0.92, and why, okay, why is there a square root of 4 up here? Okay, what, okay, so the question really is, what is the following quantity? What is 1 minus r squared divided by square root of n minus 2. What are these two doing? So what is this? What's 1 minus r squared? No one take a guess? This is the standard deviation of R. It turns out this is the standard deviation of the test statistics. Let's think about this logic. Let's think about this, okay? So let's say R is 1. Yeah? So what's going to be the standard deviation of our test statistic? It's going to be 0 because it's purely deterministic. Okay? Let's say R is 0. What's going to be the standard deviation? It's going to be 1, right? Because it's completely random, okay? So that's what this is telling me. And this is just because of the degrees of freedom. This is, a, it turns out, this is telling you just the degrees of freedom in this test. It turns out it's n minus 2, okay? Actually, do you have any idea why it's n minus 2? Why is it, why is it not n? Why is the degree of freedom not n? You have x and y, right? You have n of x, n of y, right? Why is the degree of freedom not n? You lost one degree of freedom from computing the mean of x, okay? You lose another degree of freedom from computing the mean of y. That's plus or minus y. Anyways, so this gives me a test statistic of uh, 4.72. And then why am I multiplying by 2? Two-sided yeah, two two test. And so my p-value is going to be less than 0.01. So I can reject the null. So we have strong evidence between a correlation between unemployment rate and spousal abuse. So correlation and independence. So it's only measuring linear dependence. Okay? Why is it important that we have to remember that it's only measuring linear dependence? Yeah, it's not necessarily useful if it's nonlinear. Let me try to let's draw a picture. So, what happens if our data look like the following? These are my x variables. This is y, right? And it looks like. if you fit the data to this? You fit a line to this, what's, what's it going to say? What do you think your R-score is going to be? It's going to be pretty low, right? Everyone's good by that, right? Do you think here X does explain Y? Anyone? Yeah, right? And there's a strong explanation coming over here, right? And so again, this is a problem, right? So it's only explaining linear, independ linear dependence. 
If correlation